So I want to welcome everyone here to Women of the High Seas. Thank you for joining me tonight. All right. <laughs> and if you have any questions or anything, please feel free to jump in and ask your question. I'll answer the best that I can. This is a pretty informal meeting, so we're just going to get together and talk about some interesting women. And I have my notes here because there's a lot to remember, and I'm getting older, and my memory's not that great, so <laughs> I've got my notes. So we are going to start, like, way back in history. Oh, i got someone else here. Let them in. There we go. Hello. So we're going to start way back in history, back in the 5th century BC, with Artemisia I. So she was the queen of an ancient Greek city-state called Halicarnassus, and she ruled from 484 to 460 BC. So that's quite a ways back. She was an ally of Xerxes I. He was the king of Persia. And they fought against the independent Greek city-states who were trying to take over Greece. Oh, sorry, they lived in Greece. They were, <laughs> they were trying to take over Persia. And of course, Xerxes didn't want this. But unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information about her because she's really only in the record written by one person named Heterodotus, and he wrote about a Pacific battle, the Battle of Salamis. And that's where we get all the information about her from. So the thing is, before this battle, Xerxes got this information from an informant saying, hey, dude, you should totally go ahead and attack the Greeks when they're in this area here. And you're going to have great victory. It's going to be awesome. And he wasn't too sure about this. So he went and asked all of his commanders and said, do you think this is a good idea? All the rest of his commanders who were guys were like, yeah, that sounds great. I think we should totally do this. But Artemisia is like, yeah, no, it's not a good idea. In fact, she's recording us saying, tell the king to spare his ships and do not do a naval battle because our enemies are much stronger than us at sea as men are to women. And why does he need to even risk a naval battle? Athens, for which he did undertake this expedition, is his, and the rest of Greece, too. No man can stand against him, and they who once resisted were destroyed. If Xerxes chose not to rush into a naval encounter, but instead keep his ships close to the shore, and either stay there or move them towards the Peloponnese, victory was be his. The Greeks can't hold out against him for very long they will have to leave the city because they don't have any food stored on this island, as I have learned. And when our army will march against the Peloponnese, they who have come from there will become worried, and they will not stand here to defend Athens. But if he hurries to engage, I am afraid that the navy will be defeated, and the land force is weakened as well. In addition, he should also consider that he has certain untrustworthy allies, like the Egyptians, the Cyprians, the Kilicans, and the Pamplians, who are completely useless. So this sounds like very good advice. She knew the Navy was not very good compared to the Greeks, and she knew that his allies were not to be trusted. And Xerxes went, that's really good advice. I appreciate that. Thank you for telling me. But he didn't listen to it. He went ahead and listened to all of his other commanders instead and decided that he was going to go ahead and use his army to attack Greece. And the reason for this was kind of odd. He believed that the reason his navy had not done well in the past was simply because he had not been there to witness them fighting. He believed the fact that he was not nearby made them cowardly and they didn't want to actually fight. So he thought if he's sitting on a throne, washing everything from the safety of the cliffside, they will be empowered and feel brave and confident and they would go ahead and defeat the Greeks. Needless to say, this didn't work out the way he planned. They were actually being bombarded by the Greeks and decimated. It was just not ending terribly well at all. And Artemisia is probably like, I told you this was going to happen. <laughs> she was actually in the middle of battle. She had donated five ships, and she was in charge of one of those ships and on it. And the ship was being chased by an enemy. And she couldn't get away from the enemy. No matter what she did, she couldn't outrun them. She couldn't outmaneuver them. And she was running out of space to run because in front of her was a whole fleet of friendly ships, ships that were supposed to be on her side. One of those ships was from the country of Caledonus, and the king of that country was on that ship, and she knew this. Now, the theory goes that her 
and him had had an argument a little bit before this. So maybe this kind of influenced her decision to do what she did. She actually took down the flag from Persia, from her ship, and told her crew to drive as fast as they could into that friendly ship and destroyed it, like completely obliterated it. This allowed her and her crew to get away to safety. The Greeks who were following her said, oh, well, I guess she must be on our side after all because she destroyed one of our enemy ships. They left her alone. Xerxes, sitting up on his throne in the hill, saw this and he recognized her ship. He didn't recognize the ship she hit and he couldn't see the flags. So he believed that she actually rammed an enemy. In fact, he's talking with one of his advisors and the guy is saying, see Artemisia and how well she is fighting and how she sank even now a ship of our enemy. And Xerxes responded, my men have become women and my women men. But there was a theory that Artemisia liked to fly with two flags. When she was attacking Greek ships, she would fly the Persian flag. But if she ever found herself being accosted or bothered by Greeks, or if it was convenient for her, she would remove the Persian flag and fly the Greek flag. Unfortunately, we don't have any more information about Artemisia. This is where the chronicle ends and we don't know what exactly happened to her. We do know no one survived the ship that she hit, so they weren't able to tell the fact that she hit a friendly ship. But we don't know any more about her. So that's what we know about Artemisia the first. Our next lady is a little bit more recent. She is Sayidi Ahura. We know she lived between 1485 to 1561. She was born to a wealthy Muslim family, but when she was a young girl, her family were forced to flee to Morocco because Spain was actually very actively trying to remove anyone of the Muslim faith from Spain, either by making them to convert or other means. So they got out as fast as they could. She lived a life of privilege. She learned a lot about languages, theology, mathematics, and other disciplines. She was very intelligent. But she was forced to marry at the age of 16, someone who was 30 years older than her. I know, it's kind of gross, right? This guy was a friend of her father's. He was also the governor of the city of Tetuan. And supposedly she had been promised to him when she was really little. Kind of weird. Luckily for her, he didn't live very long. He died in 1515. And when he did die, she claimed control of the city and she received the title she is known for as Sahidia Ahura, which is the great honorable lady. She would be the last queen in Islamic history to rule independently. Now she turned to piracy not because she wanted adventure or she wanted wealth, which is what happened with a lot of the women we're gonna talk about tonight. She actually just wanted to protect her town. Spain and Portugal were doing a lot of raids on her area, and they were trying to recontrol, gain control of Morocco and the sea trade. And she needed a way of defending her town from these people. The fact that Spain actually ran her family out when she was a kid didn't hurt matters any either. Getting revenge was excellent. So she stuck up a partnership with a man named Barbarossa, also known as Redbeard. He was a pretty famous pirate at his time. He used to use his fleet to run refugees from Spain to South Africa between 1504 and 1510. And he had a very fierce reputation. So due to their partnership, they actually decided to split the land and the water around them up. So she would take the western half of the Mediterranean, while he would take the eastern half. And they both terrorized Spanish and Portuguese ships. These actions gained her a lot of wealth as well as protecting her city, partially from plundering, but also because she would ransom people. So they would capture people on raids, and then they would wait till the person paid the ransom and they'd let them go. It was this ransoming that gained her the reputation as a pirate. She ruled Tetuan in the neighboring seas for over 30 years, and her reign ended because her son-in-law had decided to overthrow her in October of 1542. And he didn't hurt her, he just took the power from her. 
and she spent the rest of her days in Morocco. And she died in 19, oh, sorry, let me try that again. She <laughs> I'm way too old. She died in 1561 at the age of 75. So she lived quite a long life. This next lady, she's from Ireland. And she's pretty well known. She's Grace O'Malley. We know she lived between 1530 and 1603. She was a chieftain of the O'Malley clan, and she was a rebel, a seafarer, and a fearless leader. She challenged all the politics that were going on in 16th century England and Ireland. Irish legend has immortalized this woman as a courageous person who overcame boundaries of class and gender imbalance and bias, and they love her. The English, well, they see her a little bit differently. They saw her as a brutal and thieving pirate who controlled the coastline through intimidation and plunder. She was very aggressive. She was the daughter of a wealthy nobleman and sea trader named Dubha, this is going to be hard for me to pronounce, Dubha Dara O'Malley. He controlled the biggest fleets of ships in Ireland at the time. And this family had a history of seafaring. For hundreds of years, they've been sailing the coast around Ireland, Scotland, and northern Spain, trading, fishing, plundering. And when her father died, she decided she didn't want to go ahead and do what everyone in society said women had to do. She wanted to continue seafaring, so she took up her father's position and gained control of the fleet. She commanded some 20 ships and some hundreds of men in raids against rival Irish chieftains and various merchant ships. They were one of the few seafaring families on the western coast of Ireland, and they built a number of castles all along the coast so they could protect their property. Their main one was Rockfleet Castle, and they would plunder ships and fortresses on the shoreline and up into Scotland's outer islands. They would also tax any of the places that they plundered and would go after fishermen who were in the area from as far south as England. And what they would do was they would board the ships and then they would demand either payment or part of the cargo for safe passage. Now at this point, in the past, England really didn't care what the Irish chieftains did. They weren't too very interested. But around this time, Queen Elizabeth I was queen, and she was trying to gain control of Ireland. So she was kind of mixing things up a bit. She did what was known as a divide and conquer. She knew the Irish chieftains didn't get along, and a lot of them were constantly fighting with each other. So she didn't have the money to send armies to England, I'm sorry, armies to Ireland in order to try and control the country. So instead, she used the fact that these chieftains were fighting with each other to replace some chieftains with ones who would be loyal to her. Grace knew of this, and she wasn't having any of this. She wasn't going to let Elizabeth take over control of her lands and take her power away from her. So instead of just randomly going after various fishermen and small villages, she turned her eye to attacking English ships ruthlessly. And this became a problem for the English, because she was very effective at it. In March of 1574, they got tired of dealing with Grace constantly taking their ships and plundering them and destroying them. And she decided, England decided, well, you know, we got to take care of this. So they laid siege to Grace's castle, Rockfleet Castle. It didn't work out like they planned. Within two weeks, Grace had managed to turn her defensive maneuvers to defend her castle into attacks on the English, and they had to run away in defeat. They couldn't stand against her and her men. It's a great victory, but it was a big problem for England, and they decided we really, really have to get this woman under control. At this point, Grace is getting pretty old. She's in her 50s. She's 56. And this time, she was captured by a man named Sir Richard Bingham. He was the governor appointed to rule that part of Ireland. And he was known as being very sadistic and ruthless. Not a guy you want to mess with. So she got captured by him, and she barely escaped a death sentence from him. But at this point, again, she's getting older, and her power and influence is starting to kind of go down. And so is her wealth. She can't be out there pirating herself as much anymore. And as she's getting older, she's kind of losing control of her men. 
So she needs to find another way of dealing with this. She decides to go over Bingham's head and go right to Elizabeth I herself. She wrote to Elizabeth explaining what was happening and wanted the ability to have an audience with her. She says, I want you to give me free liberty during my life to invade with fire and sword all of your highness's enemies without any interruption of any person whatsoever. She was hoping by acting as if she was going to be defending the queen, she would have the ability to continue piracying and doing whatever she wanted. But it didn't go out how she was planning because her son soon after had been also caught by that certain Bingham guy. And he was fated for execution. So she needed to come up with something quick. She jumped on a boat and immediately sailed her boat around and up the Thames to London so she can talk with Queen Elizabeth herself. She wasn't going to wait for anyone to deliver her letter. And she kept trying to get an audience, trying to get an audience. And Queen Elizabeth was actually very interested in her because they kind of had a lot in common. They were two very strong-willed women who were dealing in a society that was very much a man's world. Elizabeth had issues with guys not wanting to listen to her. The fact despite the fact that she was the queen, the most powerful woman in the world at the time, and Grace O'Malley was also fighting against society. So Elizabeth wanted to meet her. They met in person in 1593, and Grace got the chance to talk with the woman she'd been fighting with this whole time. And they actually got along pretty good, all things considered. Grace explained that her actions were merely done to protect her family and her own people. And the queen listened and understood. Grace managed to convince the queen to free her family and to restore much of Grace's lands to her. And she also got a letter from the queen to get her son released. But unfortunately, when she got her son back, he was not doing well at all. Bingham had tortured him very badly and to the point where he could barely walk. Grace went back with her son to the home castle of Hartford, a rock feet, and they stayed there for the rest of her life. That was pretty much the end of Grace's career. These next two women, they kind of go together, and they're probably the most famous out of the bunch. First one is Anne Bonny. We know she lived between 1697 and 1782. And the other one is Mary Reed. She lived between 1685 and 1721. We know that Anne was born in Ireland. She was the illegitimate daughter of a lawyer named William Comack and his servant woman, Mary Brenham. Brenham sorry. When William's wife found out, well, she wasn't very happy about this and she left him, which kind of went okay for William. He became very attached to young Anne and wanted her to be his actual full, full on daughter. But the problem was, is he wasn't divorced. And he didn't want anyone to know that Anne was actually his child because he was a lawyer and he was worried, oh, that's going to ruin my reputation. So he had Anne dress as a boy and told everyone that Anne was actually the son of a relative who was staying with him. It was kind of a mess. <laughs> but this worked out well for him for a while until Anne got a little bit older and people kind of realized, wait a minute. That's actually your daughter, isn't that? She's starting to look like you. So he packed up Anne and Anne's mom, Mary Brennan, and they moved to the United States and settled in South Carolina. He got a plantation and continued to practice law. Anne's mother died when Anne was a teenager, and she kind of took control of the estate then. And she was kind of wild in her teen years. She liked to get into fights. She liked to drink a lot. She liked to go to bars and hang out with sailors. And she kind of got a reputation for being a little bit violent. Some people say she murdered a servant girl with a knife. And other people said that she put a young man in the hospital for a couple weeks just because he tried to make an advance on her. So she was getting a bit of a reputation. William didn't like this. And when she was 16, she fell in love with a pirate named James Bonney and married him. This was pretty much the last straw for her dad. He said, you know, that's it. Get out of the house. I don't want you here. Go. So James took his new wife down to the Bahamas to a place called New Providence. 
This was a great place for pirates. They liked to hang out there. It was kind of like a safe harbor for them. Thing is, James Bonney was a terrible pirate. He was just not any good at it at all. He couldn't make any money. He couldn't plunder anyone. It just didn't work out. So he came up with another way of making income. He decided to become a stool pigeon. He went to the governor and says, hey, I'll tell you about every pirate that you've got a list for. I can tell you where they are, what they're doing, what the crimes are, and I want some of the bounty on their heads. This angered Anne. She'd been hanging out with all these pirates. They were her friends. And now her husband was being a weasley backstabbing man and telling the governor all about everything they were doing and where they were staying. So she wanted nothing to do with him. She left him for another guy. His name was Calico Jack. And she was really into him. He was a good looking guy. He was kind of romantic. He liked to dress in flashy colors. Pretty cool. And a very successful pirate. And the feeling was mutual. He liked her too. So they got together. And even though their relationship was kept kind of quiet, everyone on the boat knew that Anne and the captain were together. Anne quickly found a place among the crew. Now, a lot of crews back at that time, they didn't really want women on the ship. They thought women were a distraction or maybe we would bring bad luck or something like that. So there was a lot of guys who didn't at first want Anne around. But she got around that pretty quick by using her brains. One of the first things she did was she played at being a murderess with a fake corpse. She took a dressmaker's dummy and she beat it up and twisted all the arms around and covered it in fake blood and put it on the deck. And then when a French merchant vessel came by, she, they found her standing over this dummy with an ax like she was going after it. And they decided, um, yeah, you can have our cargo, just leave us alone, get the crazy woman away from us. It worked wonderfully. They also said that when a member of Jack's crew told her that they didn't want her around, they didn't think that she should be on the ship, she silenced him by stabbing him through the heart. So everyone kind of found out pretty quick you don't mess with Anne. Eventually, Anne became pregnant with Jack's kid. And he didn't want to risk her having the baby at sea because there'd be all kinds of complications. So he left her in Cuba where she would be safe to deliver the baby. And the thing is, no one really knows what happened to this baby. We don't know if she gave the baby up soon after it was born, or if Jack had friends in Cuba who offered to take care and raise the baby, or if the baby didn't survive childbirth. All we knew was that a couple months later, he came by to pick her up, and she found another woman on board. This was Mary Reed. But when they first met, she didn't realize Mary Reed was a woman because Mary Reed was dressed as a man. And she started talking with Mary Reed, and Mary eventually admitted that, you know, I'm actually a woman. So Anne says, okay, don't worry, I'll keep your secret. They became really good friends at that point in confidence. And some even said they were in a couple, a relationship. And Anne and Mary actually had a lot in common. Mary was also illegitimate. Her mother's first child, from her husband, had been born a boy. And he was born soon after her husband had died at sea. Well, Mary's mom's mother-in-law felt bad and said, well, I'll give you money to support my grandson until he's an adult. This worked out great until the grandson died. Soon after, Mary's mom became pregnant and gave birth to Mary. And she wanted that money to keep coming in. So she dressed Mary to resemble her son that had died. And this worked for a while, too, until eventually the grandmother figured it out. And the money stopped coming. At this point, Mary actually was very happy dressing as a boy and passing as a guy, and she really excelled at it. She loved it. Around age 13, she served as a powder monkey. This is someone on British ships who goes ahead and carries bags of gunpowder from a ship's hold to the guns so that they can use the cannons. After she did that, she went and joined the Army of Flanders. She was in the infantry and the cavalry. She fell in love with a guy she was serving with, another soldier, and told him the fact that she was actually a woman. 
And the soldier's like, well, that's kind of cool. You know, I really like you and stuff, but I don't know if I really want to get married. Well, they kind of hit it off and they eventually did get married. Unfortunately, he didn't live very long. After he died, she went back to becoming a uh, dressing as a man and she sailed the West Indies on a Dutch ship. This ship soon ran into Calico Jack's ship and crew and they boarded and took control of the vessel. They saw Mary dressed as a guy and thought that she was a fellow Englishman and said, well, you should totally join our crew. So she did. And none of them, not Jack Calico Jack or any of his men, realized that she was a woman. She was seen, said to be very aggressive and ruthless. She always was ready for a fight, and she cursed a lot, like a lot. She also wore loose clothing so no one could see her chest, and no one cared that she didn't have facial hair because most of the pirates in Jack's crew were either in their teens or their early 20s, so they didn't have facial hair either. In fact, Jack didn't find out until he became jealous of Mary and Anne spending so much time together. Again, he thought Mary was another guy, and he was really into Anne. So he broke into Mary's cabin one day and was actually going to attack her, and she revealed the fact that I'm a woman, I'm not actually a guy. And he went, oh, okay, well, that's okay then. And he kept her secret and didn't tell anyone else and still treated her as an equal member of the crew because he liked her. And he knew now that she wasn't a rival for Anne's affections. Everything was going great until around midnight, October 22nd of 1720. And that's when everything fell apart. Anne and Mary were on deck of the ship and they noticed a mysterious ship was getting really close to theirs. And as it got closer, they realized it was a ship of the governor of the area. You don't want to mess with him. And so they went out, sent out a call saying, that the governor's coming, we got to do something. A few, including Calico Jack, responded, but most of the crew didn't. They were tired and they were actually pretty drunk. There had been a lot of partying that night. So the governor, Jonathan Barnett, he ordered the pirates to surrender. And Jack and Mary and Anne says, we're not going to surrender. And they started fighting. So Barnett started a counterattack, and this disabled Jack's ship. And it also caused the few men that were fighting on deck to go and hide in the hold, the underside of the deck. And Jack, outnumbered, went ahead and surrendered. He said, I can't do anything. I'm done. Mary and Anne refused to surrender. They kept fighting the governor's men with swords and pistols, and they were fighting on their own. And Mary became so disgusted that none of the guys were coming up there, she reportedly stopped fighting long enough to peer down into the darkness of the hold and said, if there's a man among you, you'd come up and fight like the man you are to be. But none of them came up. So she fired a shot down there and supposedly killed one of the guys. But unfortunately, eventually, Anne and Mary were also outnumbered and everyone was taken prisoner. The crew were taken to Port Royal to stand trial, and they were all found guilty of piracy and sentenced to hang. Only Anne and Mary escaped this, and that was because they were both pregnant, and they were unwilling to hang a pregnant woman. So they were both thrown in jail. Mary unfortunately died in prison of a fever, there's no record about her baby, so we don't know if she actually was pregnant or wasn't pregnant and was faking it, or if the child died really early on. As for Anne, well, Anne's father actually paid her bail and got her out and brought her back to South Carolina. She had her baby there. She also remarried soon after and eventually gave birth to eight children and died in 1782. Our next woman, she's the most successful, not even a woman pirate, probably the most successful pirate ever. Her name is Sheng Shi. She lived between 775 and 1844. We don't know very much about her early life. We do know that eventually she was working in a brothel in Canton where she met a pirate named Zheng Yi. 
he became absolutely infatuated with her. This was in 1801. And Shenji was the leader of the Red Flag Fleet. And he wanted to marry her. So no one's quite sure exactly how these two got together. There's different accounts. Some people say that Shenyi sent a raid to attack and plunder the area and told them specifically to bring back Qingxi. And when they did as he ordered, he married her. Other accounts are simply that he actually just went ahead and asked and she said, sure, that sounds great, let's do it. But she had one stipulation. She had to have some power within the organization and she had to be able to share some of that plunder. So she wanted to get some wealth and riches. So they started actually controlling the Red Flag Fleet together. And under their dual control, it expanded rapidly. Initially they had started with 200 ships, but eventually they ended up with more than 600. But Zheng Yi died in 1807, only six years after marrying Xing Shi. She knew this was a chance for her to gain control. She didn't really want to give up that power and wealth she was starting to accumulate. And she made a deal with Cheng Pao, who was Sheng Yi's adopted son, to permit her to continue being in charge of the fleet. She ran this fleet in a very orderly and business-like manner. She focused on military strategy. She was very intelligent. And she went to great lengths to actually make a government that would control everyone in the fleet. And she had some very specific rules. So for any plunder that was gotten, it had to be brought before the whole fleet before it was divided up so everyone could see how much was actually there. The ship that had gotten the plunder, they were able to keep 20% of it. The remaining 80% went to the whole fleet. That's a pretty good deal. She also had very strict rules regarding the treatment of captured prisoners, especially female prisoners. If a female prisoner was considered to be unattractive, well, she was let go without any problem. So I'd be fine because I'm kind of ugly. I'd be okay. <laughs> but if you were cute, they kept you on the boat. If a crew member wanted to marry a woman, he could get permission to do so as long as she agreed, but he had to remain faithful to her. If he was not faithful and Shen Shi found out, well, he was beheaded. She didn't put up with any of that. Deserting was also a punishable offense. So if anyone tried to desert, well, she would chase them down. So, no deserting. Under her leadership, this red flag fleet grew to a staggering 1,800 ships and 80,000 men. This is the largest pirate armada ever. The most famous pirate that we know of is Blackbeard, and he only commanded 300 men and four ships. So she was blowing everyone out of the water. She had a whole giant armada, bigger than most countries, at her control. And she used this to take control of coastal villages. So she would go ahead and they would find villages and they would plunder the villages and they would go on to the next one. But they did something else. After they plundered it, they imposed a tax. So if you didn't want them to come and plunder you again, you had to pay the tax. This ruthlessness of hers caused everyone to name her the Terror of South China. And she would attack Portuguese, Chinese, and British naval ships indiscriminately. She was just going after everyone. And no one seemed like they could take her down. She was just too powerful. She had too many people under control, too many ships. She was an amazing strategist. No one could control her or stop her. So the Chinese government decided to offer amnesty or pardons to any pirates who would give up their life of piracy with her and turn themselves in. There was only one problem. The government required the pirates to kneel before the representative of the government, who was Zhang Baoling at the time. There was also another problem. It never said what happened to all the loot that they had gained. So... Shang Shi, she's getting kind of older at this point, and she's like, I kind of want to retire, but I don't like some of these restrictions. So she sends 
Cheng Po to kind of negotiate. He comes back, the negotiations didn't work. So she goes ahead herself with 17 women and children, and she does her own negotiations. And when she leaves, she's made it so that she can retire and get her pardon. She keeps all the loot that she had gained from piracy. And she got around the having to kneel before the government representative by marrying Chang Po. He was going to be the witness, and part of the ceremony is you would kneel down and give thanks for getting married. So that met the requirement. So she got to keep everything that she had gained from being a pirate. She retired without any fear of being murdered or beheaded or put up for treason. And she got a husband out of the deal. Eventually, Chang Po died, and she went back and opened up her own gambling house. And she lived very comfortably until her death in 1844 at the age of 69. So she's our most successful pirate. The last woman here, she's kind of interesting. She's known as Sadie the Goat. And there's some debate on whether or not she was actually a real person or she was just a legend. In fact, we don't know much about her. We only know she was kicking around in the mid-1800s. And that her, her name was actually Sadie Farrell. So what we do know is she began to make a name for herself as a thief in New York's Fourth Ward in the 1860s. She was actually small and light of build but she had a very vicious streak and an interesting attack. She usually worked the streets around the docks with a male companion who gave some extra muscle. And what they would do is they would wait for someone who was drunk and incapacitated to come out of the bars and he's kind of wandering around. And then Sadie would take a running leap and then she would headbutt them right in the front and hit them right in the stomach. And this would actually knock the wind out of the guy. And this is actually a very dangerous maneuver because if you go to headbutt someone and you don't do it exactly right, you could hit your nose and break your nose or you could hit your forehead and crack your forehead open. But Sadie was a pro at this and she knew how to do it. So all I was hitting was the very top of your head, which is really hard. So the headbutted victim, he got smacked in the stomach by this very small woman coming at a rapid rate. And he's kind of winded, and he's looking at her like, what did you do? And then the guy comes up from behind and bonks him on the head, knocks him out. The guy's knocked out, so they go ahead and they take his wallet, and they take everything from him, even his clothes, and they just leave him on the ground. He's going to wake up. He's going to be fine with a bad headache. And they run off. So this isn't very profitable. There's not a lot of money in used clothes and little bits of wallet that people have come from the bar with, because there's probably not much money left in there. But it got her a reputation, a very big one. But unfortunately, Sadie was about to run into another woman who had a big reputation. And this is Gallus Mag. Gallus Mag was huge. Sadie was kind of small and petite. Gallus was about six feet. She was all muscle. Big, huge bouncer. Or a bar called The Hole in the Wall on Dover Street. And she also had an interesting move. What her job was is that she was supposed to take anyone who was being unruly and get them out. And she had a club that she would have it tied to her wrist, and she'd bunk them on the head. And if that didn't work, if they're still fighting after she bunked them on the head, no, nope. she grabbed them in a headlock, and then she'd bite their ear off. It's an aggressive woman. <laughs> so she bites the ear off, and then she takes the person, and she would plop them outside, and then... She would take the severed ear and she put it into a bottle of alcohol and she kept them on the wall behind the bar. And that was her trophy case. So everyone knew you don't mess with Gallus Mag. Everyone except Sadie. Sadie was kind of drunk and she'd gotten a little bit too much alcohol in her and she was looking for a fight. This was also kind of because of the fact that Sadie was of Irish descent and Gallus was from England. Ireland and England, they don't like each other. We found that out with, with Grace O'Malley and Elizabeth I. So we're not sure which one attacked the other one first, but they went at it. And 
Gallus is trying to bonk Sadie on the head. Well, Sadie has a hard head <laughs> because she's always headbutting people. So the bonks on the head weren't doing anything. She was still fighting. So Gallus grabbed her in a headlock and took her ear and then plopped Sadie outside. She then took the ear, put it in his own specific jar of alcohol and labeled it the ear of Sadie the goat. And she was very proud of this. Well, this wasn't going to help Sadie's reputation any because in that area of New York at the time, if you're missing an ear, everyone knows what happened to you. Oh, you, you ran in the gallus, didn't you? You got your ear bitten off. So she was embarrassed and she decided to take her show on the road. So she went to the opposite side of Manhattan, the West Side docks. And while she's there, she's observing this gang. And to be honest, they're not very good. They're kind of messing things up. They tried to steal a boat and they got ran off and they're just not very effective. So she decided to take control of this gang. And under her influence, they were able to seize a boat and then began a life of piracy all along the Hudson Valley River. And they would attack other boats on there, but mostly farmhouses and houses of rich people and small villages, and they would plunder and grab everything they could and run off. Sadie was taken with this new life of piracy. She loved it. This was great. It was much easier than headbutting people on the street, and she was getting a lot more wealth from it. So she became so fascinated, she started studying about pirates and reading everything she could about them. And after discovering that some pirates had once kidnapped Julius Caesar, she told her crew, we got to go out, we got to do this, we got to get on this kidnapping thing, this looks great. Well, for several months, Sadie and her crew were extremely successful, and they're kind of terrorizing this whole area, getting lots of money. And they were hiding in various places, so no one can get to it. Unfortunately, it didn't last very long because Sadie was extremely ruthless and she didn't just leave people, she actually, at this point, was starting to kill people. After a number of homeowners were murdered by the robbers during these break-ins, the residents all band together to take Sadie and her crew down. They ambushed the crew, which was the Charleston Street Gang, and when they came ashore, and started getting into a massive fight with them. There's a lot of people at this point just pummeling on these pirates. And they got the cops involved. And eventually, so many of her crew were incapacitated that Sadie couldn't, she couldn't deal with it. It's like, I can't, I can't, I have no one to fight for me. So she ran off and left her crew there to fend for themselves. She said, I'm done with piracy, I'm out. And she went back to her old haunts. Her crew returned, the few that were left, returned to where they came from and very quickly disbanded because without Sadie's leadership, they just weren't able to do much of anything. Sadie took the money that she had earned from piracy that she's able to recover and she opened her own gin mill and she's doing really well. And eventually her and Gallus met up again. The hole in the wall bar actually was closed down because there was a lot of fights going on and apparently the cops eventually had enough of this. So Gallus was out of a job. And she had taken one of her trophies with her, the bottle that had Sadie the goat's ear. And they met up and actually kind of struck a friendship up together and she gave the ear back to Sadie and she says, here you go, here's your ear back. And the ear was pickled from being in the alcohol that long. And for the rest of her life, Sadie wore the ear on a locket around her neck. So that was Sadie the goat. So that was our last woman of the evening. Are there any questions I can try and answer? <laughs> I love the story and I understand it completely. I I don't have no questions. I mean and jot and down some of the of the um jotting down of some of the words to remember. <laughs> cool. I'm glad you enjoyed it. They're very interesting women. There was a couple of others, too, and it was just so many. A lot of times with these programs, there's so many interesting women, and I just know there isn't enough time to get through everyone. <laughs> you want to hear more? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, yeah, a lot of it is that there are so many women to talk about, and you're just like, oh, no, I've only got a certain amount of time. <laughs> so you can try to figure out who you're going to talk about. <laughs> but... 
I'd watched a show oh, was a couple of years ago and Grace O'Malley was on it. And that's when I first learned about Grace O'Malley. I think it was like warrior women or something like that. And it was really cool. It went through various women throughout time from like, uh, what was her name? Odyssey are back in like the early Celtic and, you know, Joan of Arc was on there and it was just all these amazing women who were just out there kicking butt. And it's like, this is so cool. <laughs> you know, I have the, oh, sorry. Um, the pirate that I really like was um, the last one. Oh, Sadie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because look, it was so interesting of how like she used to, um, Eat that, like, not eat it, but, like, rip the ear off. Oh, and, yeah. Like, that's, so, I'm, like, it's kind of something, like, very weird, but she <laughs> cherished it, so. Yeah, she was, I would, I wish there was more information about Alice Mad because I would like to know where she came up with this move. What makes you think that's a great is, way? <laughs> is there a movie, movie that could show us or a book? Um, actually, I'm not sure. Let's check. But I really want to borrow it if it is. I know we have one. Where is it? I'm going to go get it. About uh, pirate women. Pirate women. Let me find the title for you. Or maybe we can look on YouTube. There was some things on YouTube. Um, what is it called again? Well, I put, put into our catalog pirate woman, women, and I got daring pirate women. And I know we had another one. I'm not seeing it. Because we have... Because remember for the trick or treat, it says that you're supposed to borrow a book before using it. I'm going to borrow that book. Oh, well, we do have one that is a um, digital copy. It's called Pirate Women, the Princesses, Prostitutes, and Privateers Who Ruled the Seven Seas. And it's got this woman on the front. She's kind of got like a C thing going on with her. <laughs> we'll write that. So it is. Uh, I could put it into the chat. Let's see if we can put it here. Oh, yes, please. That'll be much more helpful. Yeah. That right. Pirate. I like copying. I like copying things that are mostly in the chat because it, it gives you much more and, you, and it shows you the correct words and you don't write it so bad. Yeah, me too. I'm just very slow typer, so. There were a lot of women who went to sea, not just as pirates, but as support. So they were there as merchants. Sometimes they helped with um, the health of the crew. Sometimes they were just like hangers on, so they might have been like a wife of one of the crew members or a friend. But a lot of women would actually disguise themselves as guys because there was that fear that having women on the boat would actually be bring bad luck. That was some kind of weird superstition lust sailors had. And sailors and pirates at the time were very superstitious. But they would actually have certain tattoos on certain parts of their body. So, like, they might put an anchor on a specific part of their body, and that would kind of symbolize that as long as you have that anchor there to show, well, you weren't going to sink. It was kind of weird stuff like that. Because I can't remember that show I had watched, and it was, it was an amazing show. <laughs> but I did put Pirate Women into YouTube, and I got a lot about, um, there's a video about Anne Bonnie. It's a couple on Xing Shi. So there's actually a lot out there, too, on YouTube where you can get more information and learn about more of these women. I didn't have any photos other than the two that are behind me here because it was really hard to get images since these women had lived so long ago. We don't actually have any photos. So you would put in Anne Bonnie and you would get... 20 drawings and they all look completely different so I couldn't tell which one was actually closest to how she would have looked. Supposedly the two women behind me are supposed to be Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed but we're not sure because it was another drawing that looked again looked completely different so <laughs> we're just so far back that there just isn't really much visual information that was actually available. Is there another meeting from when is the other meeting of this the sport one. So let's see. It's in 
November, I think it's about mid-November. Let me find the date for you. Okay. So it's going to be Wednesday, November 18th. It's also going to be at 5.30. So we're going to talk about women in sports, like the woman who broke the first woman to break the world speed record, and then the woman who she won the, I can't pronounce it, the Itagod, it was the massive um, thousand mile sled dog race they do every year. And the first women to swim the English Channel and all kinds of stuff. So it's going to be pretty cool. <laughs> okay. I can't wait. Awesome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I like seeing you all here. I miss seeing everyone since we're not allowed in the library anymore. So <laughs> we can't do our regular programming. So I should probably let everyone go so y'all can eat dinner and get ready for relaxing for the night. But thank you for joining me tonight. So if you have any ideas or anything, just like I said, just give me an email, let me know, and we'll see if we can get some interesting programs going that y'all like, okay? Okay. Well, I'll see you guys later. Okay, bye. bye. See you another day. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. It was a thank lot you. of fun learning about a new, uh, new things. Cool. I appreciate it. I'm glad you all had a good time. <laughs> Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.